All right, so um, I'm going to talk about um, VLAN theory and implementation for the, about the next 40 minutes or so. It's going to be a fairly short presentation unless there's lots of questions. Um, before I get right into it, I just thought I'd ask for a show of hands. Who here has actually implemented VLANs or worked with VLANs on switches? Okay, <laughs> so you're probably not going to learn a lot of new stuff in that presentation. How many of you have implemented VLANs on a Linux system? Okay, <laughs> almost the same people. All right, um, so anyway, for those of you who haven't here, this may be something new. For those of you who have, this might just be a little bit of a review. Um, so my name is Gilbert Dutilio. I work for the U of M, and I thought I would credit them in this presentation because a lot of what I learned about VLANs, I learned there. Um, and uh, yeah, so. I should apologize for this next slide. It used to always bug me when I would read an intro to programming book and chapter one was always the binary system. <laughs> and they would teach you hex and whatever. Well, it seems every presentation on networking or every book on networking always starts with the seven layer model. <laughs> so I'm not gonna go into all the details of every layer. A lot of the layers aren't really relevant to what I'm gonna talk about, but I just wanna make sure that people are clear on what the bottom three layers are because that's what we're really going to focus on. And actually, we're really going to focus on layer two mostly. Um, but yeah, when people commonly talk about layer one, they're talking about the physical medium. Um, and that could be um, copper wire, it could be fiber optic, it could be airwaves. Um, and you're usually dealing with, you know, properties like signals and propagation delays and all of those kinds of electrical properties or physical properties of that medium. Um, in terms of what we're going to talk about tonight, we don't really need to worry about that level of detail. Um, just you need to, to, to just understand that layer is, is underneath there and everything else builds on top. And the idea with the seven layer model and most protocol implementations is they're designed in such a way that you can swap out one of the underlying layers without any impact on the layers above that. Um, so just as long as everything can talk to each other. Um, so it's various layers of abstraction. At uh, layer two, we're dealing with, in our context, Ethernet frames. Um, and this is where things like switches and bridges work, is, is at layer two. Um, and uh, layer three, uh, doesn't really enter the, into this very much, although there are um, things called layer three switches and there are routers uh, that are VLAN aware. And in fact, when we implement VLANs under Linux, there's kind of some layer two issues and layer three issues that we need to worry about. <clears throat> so there's a lot of terminology associated with these different layers as well. And this is also a little bit of kind of a review of how the technology has evolved. We used to um, have uh, Ethernet as kind of a bus topology network with just things kind of strung together, uh, daisy chain style. And uh, everything um, was, was basically sharing the, the, the same medium and all the traffic was visible to every interface on that medium. Uh, and then technology was introduced at layer one to allow you to extend beyond the physical lengths of, of a particular wire segment. And so we used things like repeaters and hubs. Couple concepts to understand about those. Um, there's something called a collision domain. And typically um, that is everything that is connected at layer one would be part of one collision domain. Um, so when you're using a hub or a repeater, essentially everything is in the same collision domain. There's also a concept called broadcast domains, and that's essentially what, uh, what nodes are going to see broadcast packets. And that turns out it's, it's more of a layer two issue. Everything that is connected virtually at layer two is part of one broadcast domain. So when you introduce uh, a bridge, essentially 
everything on one side of the bridge is one collision domain and everything on the other side is a separate collision domain, but they're part of the same broadcast domain. So they're gonna see the same broadcast traffic on either side. Um, a switch is essentially uh, the same concept as a bridge, but multi-port, more than two ports. And so there, um, every connection directly to the switch will be its own collision domain. So in this case, we've got four ports, so four collision domains. But again, still all one broadcast domain. If you use a router instead of a switch, um, typically with a router, everything is a separate subnet uh, on, on every port. And so um, not only is it four collision domains, but it's also four broadcast domains in this uh, example here. Is that all clear? Okay. All right. So that's enough background. Now I think we understand all the concepts to be able to understand the Wikipedia um, VLAN definition. This is slightly redacted just to keep it simple. But uh, so it defines a virtual LAN as uh, any broadcast domain that is partitioned and isolated in a computer network at the data link layer. In other words, OSI layer two. Um, creating the appearance and functionality of network traffic that is physically on a single network but acts as if it's split between separate networks. So that's a lot of verbiage, um, but essentially what you're doing is, is you're taking your, um, your layer two and you're partitioning it out into separate broadcast domains. Or in more common parlance, you're creating subnets out of that. Um, so. Let's take a look at what that would look like in the simplest possible case. So we've got one switch, eight ports, two separate VLANs that are color-coded here. And so the idea here is everything that's coded uh, in green would be part of one VLAN and everything that's in orange would be a separate VLAN. And so the idea is that these two PCs that are both on the green VLAN would be part of one broadcast domain. They would see each other's traffic. And likewise, these two are part of a separate broadcast domain. They'll see each other's um, traffic. But no traffic's gonna go between these two unless you connect something between them at layer three. So, um, so a router or something could be hooked into each VLAN and then it could route traffic between them. So two isolated subnets. Um, okay, so simple example. Typically a VLAN is not just going to be implemented on one switch though. You're going to have to connect several switches together. Now, remember I mentioned that these VLANs are, are separate. They're not routing traffic between them. So in theory, what you then have to do is connect between each switch each of those separate VLANs. But clearly you don't want to do this with physical connections. In this case, it's just two, but if you had four different VLANs, you'd be using up four ports just for interconnecting, which doesn't make any sense. What you really want to do is have some kind of um, connection that multiplexes all of your VLANs together. And in Cisco parlance and it's kind of become commonly used in the industry is, is what's called a trunk um, port. Uh, and when a port is configured in trunking mode, essentially what you're doing is you're allowing traffic from multiple VLANs to flow across that interface. And the way they do that is they uh, implement something called uh, VLAN tagging. And there's actually an IEEE standard that defines that. So let's take a bit of a closer look at this. Um, this standard was actually kind of controversial when it was introduced. Um, there was a separate IEEE subcommittee, I think it was 802.3, that defined essentially the layer two format for ethernet. It defined what an ethernet frame looks like. And there was pressure on this committee throughout its history or the subcommittee to modify the frame format for various purposes. And they always resisted that. 
And here, a separate subcommittee basically told them, oh, by the way, we're going to introduce some new data right in the middle of your, uh, your uh, frame header. Um, but it, it turned out it was essentially the only way that this could be done uh, at the layer two was to actually modify the frame format. Other things had been proposed and rejected, like doing deep packet inspection to look at layer three information. But then that means your VLAN implementation would be dependent on whatever your protocols were above that and say, what would happen then if you changed the formats there? It could break your, your standards. So, um, so essentially, yeah, what was done is uh, after the source and destination MAC addresses, they inserted a 32-byte header um, that is composed of the following fields. There's a, the first half of it is essentially just a fixed value. So it's called the tag protocol identifier or TPID. Um, and it's, yeah, 16 bits has a fixed value and that's just to identify this as this little thing that's been inserted into the frame. Um, the next couple uh, fields, it's actually four bits combined. Um, are actually not anything to do with VLANs per se, but it was introduced at the same time um, for special hardware that could benefit from VLANs plus other things. Um, and so essentially what they implement is a, a class of service and a single bit for congestion management. And these would be used uh, typically by things like uh, voice over IP devices, but could also be used by other things. Typically, it's going to be for some sort of streaming type of, of technology where uh, you're going to have a lot of data. So you may want to assign it a different uh, class of service. And you may want to indicate whether it's OK to just drop packets if things get too congested. Um, for the purposes of what we're talking about tonight, we don't need to worry about that. Though. And then the last field within there is the one we're really interested in. And that's the remaining 12 bits out of the 32 bits. And it's called the VID, or VLAN identifier. And with 12 bits, um, that gives you 2 to the 12 possible numbers, which would be 4096. But uh, the very bottom and very top values are reserved for special purposes, and so they're not available as IDs. So that leaves you with a theoretical limit of 4,094 possible VLANs. And I say a theoretical limit because um, not all switches uh, will give you all of those. Um, some switch manufacturers have other codes that they reserve for special purposes. And so I've seen maximums of 4093, for instance, uh, in some switches. Um, also, this was maybe more of an issue in the early days. Um, I've really only seen it with kind of very low end hardware uh, these days. But um, <laughs> typically, the, the VLANs uh, have to be stored in, in some sort of lookup table. And that lookup table might be a fairly limited size. So I've seen uh, numbers like 256 VLANs. You can use any of the, the possible codes, but you're limited to a maximum uh, of 256 simultaneous um, VLANs. And in some old 3Com switches that I had to work with at one place, um, the lookup table was actually limited to 16 entries. And so, yeah, you, again, you could use any of the possible VLAN IDs, but only 16 of them simultaneously in any given switch. Okay, any questions about that? Okay. This one may be something that some of you haven't seen before, even if you've worked with VLANs. Uh, there's this concept called double tagging, and there's a separate standard for that. Um, the question came up, what if a particular um, company has remote sites and they want to implement a VLAN architecture, uh, 
across these remote sites. And they're engaging the services of some ISP that also has a VLAN structure. So how do you do that? Um, so their solution to this was to implement something called double tagging. So essentially, instead of having just the one tag, you have two tags. The first one being an S tag, which is a service tag, and that's used by the ISP to define their different VLANs, one of which would be a particular customer's VLAN. And then the second tag would be the C tag, the customer tag. And so they have to be in that order. And the TPID, that first 16 bits, is different for the S tag than it was for the C tag. So looking at this diagram, it's tempting to think, oh, OK, this is recursion, right? You could just add <laughs> these forever. No, the standard defines exactly this. You can have 0, 1, or 2 tags, and no more than that. Um, and yeah, this double tagging would really be only used in particularly uh, esoteric um, situations, which we're not going to worry about. So let's look at a more typical type of uh, situation that uh, we might encounter um, in either a small organization or a larger organization. So here's kind of a, a simplified model of what a, a, a multi-switch uh, setup might look like. Um, and I'm just going to introduce a few more concepts here. Um, okay, so in this particular example, we've got three separate VLANs, but you can extend that to any number you want. And just for the sake of argument, we'll say that this VLAN 10 is going to be um, something that this particular company is going to use for uh, customer access. It might be kind of like a guest access. It might uh, be like free Wi-Fi service to their customers or something. So fairly low security, um, but might be quite widely available. And then they'll have sort of an intermediate VLAN that'll be for their typical employees. And then they might have a more secure VLAN that might be used for, say, people that are working with financial data or other sensitive data. And you want to make sure that that's only um, used by you know, the, the, the people within the organization that, that should be authorized to use that. So um, you're going to have different levels of switches to interconnect this. Um, some terminology that gets used, Cisco has kind of a best practice type of recommendation for how to set up your network. And they recommend having this, these two levels. You've got access switches, which are the ones that actually provide individual access, like ports for individual computers to use. Um, and then those access switches will all be connected together with distribution switches. And essentially, the distribution switches are only uh, using trunk mode. And they're just routing like traffic to the higher levels of the network and routing between everything, um, but not providing any direct access to an individual um, uh, user's computer. Um, in a smaller organization, you might not want to go to that structure. You might have more of a hybrid model where switches will have a combination of ports in access mode and other ports that are in trunk mode that are doing the distribution. And in organizations larger than this, you might want to introduce some redundancy. And that would typically be done at this later and up. So your access switches might have um, links going to separate uh, distribution switches so that there's redundancy if one of those distribution switches goes down, you still have connections to others. And likewise, you might have, instead of just one router, you might have um, a group of core routers uh, that are interconnected and, um, uh, and re with redundant links again between those and your distribution switches. Um, this router might look a little funny in that it's only got one physical connection, but keep in mind that that's a trunk, and so that's representing multiple uh, VLANs or multiple subnets. And so this is actually serving the purpose of routing, even if there's just one physical interface. But of course, it might also connect to higher levels of the network as well. 
Okay. <clears throat> so looking at uh, just some Cisco IOS commands that you would use for uh, setting up interfaces, this is how you would typically set up an interface in access mode. And that would be essentially to lock a particular port to one uh, specific VLAN. And um, uh, yeah, so, so for, for this example, we'll just uh, say we want to configure that port to, to access VLAN 10. Um, so essentially, you identify the interface. You say that uh, with this command here, you identify the VLAN it's going to use. And then you set the port to access mode. And essentially, uh, going back to the idea of the VLAN tagging, um, once a port is in this mode, essentially there's no tagged traffic, okay? So what uh, is gonna be seen by a computer connected to that port is just untagged traffic, and it's only on that VLAN, but the whole concept of VLAN is essentially hidden to a device on that port. And so that's typically how you're going to configure an end node, like a, a PC or, or any, any other sort of computer. Um, it's also uh, potentially useful if you've got, maybe not relevant anymore, but in the early days of VLAN, people still had legacy hardware that didn't implement VLANs. And so you would probably want them set up in access mode. Um, and uh, again, looking at the example we had before of an access switch, uh, the uplink port that connects to the distribution switches would have to be in trunking mode. And this is the way you would do that. You would identify the interface. And then this is what says that we want to use uh, 802.1Q uh, encapsulation. So that just sets the, the standard that's going to be used. That says we want to use VLAN tagging on that. And then you set the switch port mode to trunk. Okay. Um, oh yeah, one thing I didn't mention earlier, but uh, before you can use VLAN numbers in any of these commands, you have to tell the switch what are the valid VLANs. And so typically there's just a single command you can use uh, to set them up or you can set them up separately. Um, but yeah, you have to tell the switches, these are the VLANs that are defined, and then you can go ahead and use them. So what I'm showing you here is, um, what if you've got a trunk uh, port, but you don't want it to carry all the possible VLANs that you've got defined? Remember, we had that VLAN 30 that was, you know, a more secure thing, say, for, for carrying uh, financial data or other more sensitive data. Well, you wouldn't necessarily want that going all the way to, say, uh, a wireless access point where you're doing um, uh, your guest network or your, your regular Wi-Fi network for the employees. So this is a way you could set up a restricted trunk port um, by saying on that particular trunk, these are the only allowed VLANs. And then one other thing you can do which is potentially useful. Um, remember the idea of, of tagged packets? Um, uh, the idea was that that tag is optional. So what would happen then if you had a mixture of tagged and untagged packets on a trunk port? Um, it turns out that's perfectly valid, uh, but you would have to tell the switch what you want it to do with the untagged traffic. And that is, in um, Cisco parlance, what's called a native VLAN. In um, the IEEE terminology, they refer to a PVID, a port virtual, port VLAN ID, sorry. Um, and the idea is when you identify a PVID or a native VLAN, uh, that says that all of the untagged traffic will be treated as if it were tagged with that particular VLAN number. Um, it turns out in best practice, um, uh, they, they usually discourage the use of that. They say that for um, trunking uh, mode ports, you should have only um, tagged traffic and not allow a mixture of the two. 
It turns out there's a particular exploit that can be used where you can inject tags and uh, it's called VLAN hopping. So to avoid that, they recommend not doing this. Um, but I found that if you're doing a transition from an untagged environment to, or an, a, an environment without VLANs to an environment where you're reconfiguring all your switches to support multiple VLANs, this can be very useful during the transition is to say, okay, we're gonna allow mixed traffic on these ports for the time being, and um, we can identify the default port or the, the native port as, as uh, the native VLAN, rather, as being a particular number. And then once you've got everything configured the way you want, then you can, you can disable those, those defaults. Any questions about this? Okay, that's about all I was going to say about the Cisco setup and the concepts. So now I'm going to switch to talking about what you would do in a Linux environment. So it turns out that VLAN support is available natively uh, within the Linux kernel. And um, if you've ever looked at uh, the mechanism that Linux uses for virtual interfaces, where you would have like a, uh, the base uh, interface number and then colon and then some sort of uh, identifier number after that, um, the VLAN uh, interfaces are done in a very similar mechanism. So you've got the idea of a parent interface and child interfaces that are tied to that parent interface. And the parent interface corresponds to an actual physical interface um, that is, is on the box. So uh, I'm using just ETH0 in, in the examples here, but that, of course, could be whatever, whatever is the identifier for that that physical interface. So when you're implementing VLANs this way, the parent interface ends up being used for the untagged frames, or in other words, in the Cisco terminology, the native VLAN, or in our IEEE terminology, the PVID. Um, so if, if you set up VLANs support on that interface through the child interfaces, then the parent is basically just being used for untagged traffic. Um, you define a separate child interface for each VLAN you want to implement access to on that particular host. And uh, those interfaces will send and receive tagged frames, of course, with the tag being the, uh, the VLAN ID that you've defined on that interface. And, um, right. And once those interfaces are set up, Everything else configuration-wise is just like it would be on the parent. You, you basically, you can uh, use ifconfig. You can use any of the other commands you would normally use to set up an interface. Um, and they can have all the same properties. Um, the tagging of the, the VLANs uh, is, is done at the kernel level. There's typically no direct user level manipulation of those tags. Um, within your, your programs. Um, yeah, that's all I'll say about that right now. So if you want to work at the command line level, there's different ways you can do. You can uh, set up the, the VLANs. If you're typically working with things like ifconfig to do the, the configuration of an interface, there's a corresponding command called vconfig that lets you set up or tear down these VLAN interfaces. And so essentially to set it up, you would just do add and you give the parent uh, interface name and then the VLAN ID. And it will automatically construct the child interface with the name of parent interface dot and then VLAN ID. So in this case, ETH0.10. If you're uh, used to using the IP commands in uh, Linux, which is now the preferred um, or recommended uh, set of commands to use as opposed to the ifconfig, um, it turns out there's a uh, link subcommand uh, to the IP command 
that lets you do essentially the equivalent function. Uh, the syntax is a little more verbose, uh, which is both good and bad, I guess. <laughs> um, so essentially the syntax is IP link, add link, a little redundant <laughs> there, but you're adding the link uh, to here is the parent interface ID you're specifying. And then with name, you're explicitly saying what the name is. And then type VLAN ID 10. And so you're explicitly stating the VLAN ID. So it turns out since you've explicitly stated what the parent uh, interface name is and the VLAN ID is, you can actually use a different name than what the convention would be. And that would work. Um, there are still advantages to using the normal convention, one of them being clarity, of course. Um, but there's also a more subtle thing if you get into setting up interfaces where you want to implement the same VLAN on multiple parent interfaces, then you need a way of distinguishing the child interfaces between those. So making it explicit by having the parent ID dot and the VLAN ID is the best way to, to set that up. Um, for those of you using uh, 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 network, network Manager, uh, there is a command line interface to it and it with a whole bunch of different subcommands. And this is essentially the subcommand you would use to do the equivalent of that. And regardless of, of which of these three, oh yeah, and here this shows again the interface name with a different syntax than what was, was done there. Um, and that's perfectly valid, but may be discouraged. <laughs> um, and regardless of, of which of these three methods you use for setting up the, the, the child interface for the VLAN, the rest of the setup is essentially the way you would do any interface. Um, but typically, if you're using vconfig, you would then use ifconfig. If you're using IP link, you would use the other IP commands to configure the interface. And if you're doing things with Network Manager, you would continue in that vein. Um, of course, these commands basically just set things up for uh, while that, that kernel is running. You reboot, all the setup is lost. So if you want a more permanent setup, typically there's configuration files that you would use. Um, the traditional method on Red Hat type systems was the IFCFG files. And it turns out it's dead trivial to set them up in there. Uh, you just set up the IFCFG file with dash, and then again, parent interface dot VLAN ID and repeat that same device name on the device equals line. And then you add this line, VLAN equals yes. And that's all there is to it. That will define that, that interface. And then the rest of the setup would be just the, the same way you would normally do it. If you're more familiar with the Debian type envi environment or Ubuntu, um, essentially in your interfaces file, you would use this syntax here. Um, auto, and again, parent interface ID, dot, and VLAN ID. Uh, iFace, same thing, repeated, INET static, and then your parameters. And then this essentially makes it explicit what your parent ID is. Um, it turns out if you leave this out, as long as you've used the parent ID in these, it will infer that, and, um, and so that can be left out. Uh, doesn't hurt to make it explicit, of course. And if you do make it explicit, you can also change these. But there is nowhere that you're stating the VLAN ID explicitly other than right here. So you do have to be consistent in that regard, at least. You prefer GUIs? You can do it that way, too. Um, this is the typical uh, network manager setup under um, uh, GNOME. And uh, this is essentially more or less pulled out of the, uh, the Red Hat instructions for how to do that setup. Uh, I updated the screenshot, though, because their example was out of date. And I'm paraphrasing on the text. But they say, open the network window, which is you know, the network control panel, or whatever it's called, um, within, uh, within GNOME. And uh, 
it will show you a list of the interfaces that are already defined and underneath that there's going to be a plus and a minus. You click on the plus sign and on the pop-up dialog that shows up, you select VLAN from the list of different interface types that you can add. And then this dialog should show up already open at the VLAN tab. And then all you do is you select your parent interface from the drop-down list that's already populated with all the known physical interfaces on that system. You type in a VLAN ID and you type in the VLAN interface name. And so again, you're picking the parent interface and the VLAN ID explicitly. So the interface name you can take liberties with there. Um, they usually recommend using this notation, VLAN explicitly typed in followed by the ID, but you can use the old convention of parent interface name dot and the VLAN ID as usual. Um, it also lets you manipulate a few little flags here. Um, I'm not going to get into too many details about this. There's a couple different protocols that are used for uh, VLAN registration, and that tends to be in more advanced setups, and I wasn't really going to talk about that in this presentation. But if you're interested in doing that for a larger network, or if you're doing this on a network where you're already using VLAN registration protocols, uh, you may need to configure your Unix interface or your Linux interface to use that. Um, won't worry about that one. Reorder headers is the other one. It comes with that checkbox already checked by default. And we didn't really look at the equivalent in the command lines, but I believe that would not be checked by default. Uh, that particular flag on the interface. Um, for most purposes, it doesn't matter whether it's checked or not. You're not going to see any difference. The only difference is in the handling of kind of the raw packets. If you're using your socket in packet mode to ac access the, the entire header, including the frame header, um, what reorder headers does is essentially make the the fact that it's a VLAN transparent. I believe all it does is it strips out that, that little inserted thing. And the only reason you would want to do that is if you're using software that needs to look at the, the Ethernet frame, for instance, a DHCP server. So when this box is checked, it makes it much more transparent. You, you, the traffic is indistinguishable from what it would be on an environment without VLANs. The disadvantage to having it checked by default is it will slow down your uh, traffic a little bit because each of these frames has to be rewritten, that, or the header has to be rewritten. Um, and so by having that not checked, as long as you're not looking at raw packets, it's probably better, it'll just be more efficient. Okay, and then once you've set up your options there, you just click save and your interface is done. So if you're interested in reading up more on um, VLANs, uh, Wikipedia has a few good articles on various components of it, including explaining the tagging, the double tagging, the multiple registration protocols that I alluded to. Um, also, if you're working in a Cisco environment, Cisco has tons of resources. One thing I found useful was this particular link. Uh, don't bother about writing these down. I'm gonna have these slides available on the MUG website, and all of these are, are hot links that you can use. Um, this site was basically just generic Linux setup. It explained the commands and explained the various other ways of doing it. Um, the, the setup on, on specific Linux distros. Um, this one was Red Hat specific and gave all the, the ways you typically set up VLANs in a Red Hat environment. And then this one was Debian specific. Any questions? Yeah. Can I forward VLAN traffic between different cables and chains of uh, IP tables? I believe you can, yeah. 
Um, well, are, are you trying to forward it with the tags in, or...? Once you put IP tables, you'd be layer three. Yeah. You'd be, it's doing yeah. or yeah. yeah. It's uh, layer two yeah, there there are a few things you can do at layer two within IP tables. There's there's some Ethernet related stuff, but typically what you're going to be doing within IP tables, you're going to be working with a specific VLAN on one of those child interfaces. If you want to do forwarding of the traffic, you kind of have to work within a routing framework, a layer three framework, right, to to get that because you're not going to be directly manipulating those tags. And I don't think IP tables will, will have any way of remapping tags for you or anything. So, so essentially, what you're working with, for all intents and purposes, is the traffic that's been stripped of tags. And the only way you can tell what VLAN you're on is by what child interface you're explicitly stating in your IP tables rules. Does that make sense? Or did that answer the question? Or? Yeah, something to look into further. It was uh, just a thought, though. I don't think I'd ever have to do that. Okay. Just one comment. Mm -hmm. um, so you have the Cisco provided, or the, the Cisco specific uh, configs and whatnot. Mm -hmm. From experience, uh, just as it's just as easy to implement with a Dell switch or with whatever I've got. It. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I take it that your networking switching hardware also has to support VLANs. Am I correct in assuming that basically any switch you buy anywhere nowadays will have it? I think I forgot to mention that earlier. Um, typically, what you're looking at is managed switches uh -huh. and not just any switch. And the reason should be obvious when you think about it. You need to have a way of configuring what ports are going to be on what VLAN and what ports are going to be trunking. So you need some sort of management interface to that switch. So your typical sub $100 um, unmanaged switch is not usually going to have any VLAN support. So, so it's basically kind of critical when you're setting up the VLAN that you know these ports are on this particular LAN, these ports are on this particular lab. Yeah. Plug it into the wrong port, you're not going to get it. That's correct. right. Yeah, yeah. If you're looking to implement this on any network of any reasonable size that doesn't already have a VLAN architecture in place, one of the first things you're going to have to do is a port survey. Mm -hmm. And like, look at, at all of your wiring, um, see for each of your switches what port is going to where, and then decide for, for each of those ports. What VLAN is it going to make sense to have that port configured for? So that's the tedious part of, of doing the setup is, is the port survey and then configuring individual port configurations on each of the switches. How overlapping VLANs. Overlapping v VLANs. <laughs> <laughs> yes and no. Um, <laughs> It actually surprised me when I looked at one particular switch and they did talk about, um, about implementing that because I, I, I thought that was explicitly not allowed. So I reread the, uh, the IEEE, well not the actual IEEE specs, but the way it's summarized under Wikipedia and a couple other sources. Um, and there was nothing that said that it's not allowed. And I, I found one switch manufacturer that actually did implement it, and it was documented. So you could have multiple VLANs on your switch, and you could configure a port in access mode to be on more than one VLAN. Now, if you think about it, that creates a really weird broadcast domain. <laughs> um, but it was allowed, 
And uh, at one site where I was, I was actually uh, just doing some volunteer work and, and we were implementing VLANs, the person in charge was actually thinking of using that feature to implement some sort of VLAN security without having to worry about all the layer three issues of defining multiple subnets and routing traffic between the subnets and deciding which uh, servers had to be multi-homed and all of this stuff. He thought this would be much simpler to do. Problem was, um, he had a number of different uh, switch brands and there was only one brand of his switches that supported that. And more fundamentally, the problem was he was using um, some virtual hosts under Microsoft Hyper-V. And Hyper-V has actually quite nice VLAN support built into it, but it didn't allow overlapping VLANs either. So, so yeah, it's, it's technically possible, but it's a weird beast and it's not universally um, supported. And so I'd have to say that best practices would discourage the use of that. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, just further to Brian's question, last year's mud lines, one of the ones I did, uh, I found a switch that supported VLANs, and I think it was like 50 bucks or something, and it was, oh, wow. by the way, it's just an A-port switch or something, but you okay. check last year's mud lines and see. Uh, if you look for one that's smart or web smart, as well as managed, they'll support it as well, and they're a lot yeah. cheaper than yeah. fully managed. Yeah, the cheapest I had come across was TP-Link had yeah, a it. managed switch for about 250 Canadian for a 24 port managed yeah, switch with lines. SFP ports as well. So you could do fiber optic for your uplinks. Yeah. Um, Microtik is another one. Microtik, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they make lots of interesting stuff. Yeah. Second that one. Yeah. And then actually probably the cheapest way to start playing around with VLANs is again to find a router that'll, that you can flash OpenWRP on. Yep. Yeah, both OpenWRT and DDWRT, I believe, have VLAN support in there. And they're Linux-based, so they would use the essentially the mechanism I described under the hood. Carrying on from your other comment, uh, any switches downstream from that uh, managed switch, as long as they're all on the same VLAN, yep. they don't have to be matched. Am I correct? That is correct. Yeah, yeah. because yeah. there's no crossover traffic at the... Uh, yeah. 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 As long as nobody starts like yeah. something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, typically, what you'd want to do for any unmanaged switches that are downline from your managed switches is set those ports up in access mode, and so everything down from there is strictly on the one VLAN that you've set up in yeah. access mode. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other way I've heard you could play with this on the budget, like that. There's um. There's software that's like a software switch, and you run it in a virtual machine. And you know, if you're simulating an A port switch, you would put like eight NICs on that virtual machine. But I, mm -hmm. I can't remember the name of what any of the those software switches out there are. Open V switch or something? Open V switch, okay. Okay. So, I, just, I, I just read one that the other day. That would be the complete budget option uh, if you also don't want hardware to fix. I haven't figured out how to use it yet. Well, you, can even, you can even just make bridges in Linux, bridge interfaces yeah. between, mm -hmm. yeah. between your VLAN interfaces and you've got a Linux software switch. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that's probably what OpenV switch is for. It's like, mm -hmm. OpenV switch has a few more extra features. Yeah. Well, is it, uh, is it the English Linux under the surface or is it something else? Sorry? OpenV switch, is it Linux under the surface or something else? Uh, well, it's actually software that runs on Linux. Oh, I see. It's being used to open. Yeah. Doesn't help. Yeah. But implements um, more sophisticated things than just having a local bridge interface or multiple virtual interfaces, obviously. You can do yeah. a lot of fancy things like distributed free switches mm -hmm. across multiple machines. You can transfer traffic tunneled across them to support the distributed. Or like a typical match switch that kind of comes with the web interface as well, so just like a you get with a match switch. Yeah, I don't know if it has anything like that. Or like the other one, most of the command one. Uh, All right, thanks, Joe. Thank you.